Welcome, Royal Family. We are back again. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. I'm so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Hey, any you old school rock and rollers know that? Let me know. Shows you very old school if you know the lyrics to that song. Um, we are in Matthew lesson 121, 121 messages into Matthew. Stretch out your hand is the title. And it's the year of our Lord, 2019, November the 12th. Thanksgiving is coming up very soon. So next week, I'll probably only get one message in before the holiday. Um, this week, you have this message today. You have another message coming up on Thursday, which will be at gbible.org. It is my Malachi message at Grace Bible Church, gbible.org. It will be put on this front page here on my YouTube channel. And uh, I want to keep a friend of mine, Pete, very close buddy of mine, many, many years, uh, his uh, stepdaughter in prayer. Uh, her name is Delaney. We're not going to get into details. And I just want to be um, saying some prayers for her. She's a young woman, high school age, um, dealing with some stuff that I think she needs some prayer and she needs the, the light of God in her life. So please keep that in prayer for me. And I want to send, a, uh, send a, a shout out to the mighty one. He knows who he is. Uh, he just donated on the GoFundMe page. I greatly appreciate that. That's the only page I have right now. Uh, easiest access to give credit card donations if you're interested. There was also another uh, big donation on there as well from Julie. Um, and I just want to be, you know, sending it out there, letting you know when stuff like that happens, I believe it's God, the Holy Spirit, motivating people to uh, wake up to their calling, to give to a ministry, and maybe find their right pastor, teacher, and, and, and keep the keep the words going because we don't know who this is going to touch. And also it touches me in a lot of ways where it comes to the point where I realize there are people out there who are serious and they really want to go forward in the plan of God and possibly have this as a full-time ministry someday. So um, all, the, all that being said, I am grateful. Thank you all. And please keep my friend Pete, his daughter, in prayer, stepdaughter. And having said that, keep our president in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. I'm asking you to touch those lives of those people I've mentioned out there, whether you're protecting our leaders in Washington, D.C., or, or you're touching that young woman, Delaney. Uh, Father, I'm also asking you to bless those people that give to this ministry and support this ministry in many different ways, Father, financial and verbal support, and, and just maybe sharing the likes and sharing on the Internet, which helps the ministry as well, Father. So bless all those things and touch all those things with your mighty hand through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Matthew, Lesson 121. Stretch out your hand. Closed fist, it stays empty, right? It's like that glass. If a glass is half full of water, you can't fill it up. Sometimes you got to empty things out and open your hand up, get it from the clenched fish, open it up, and God can put something in it. That's what we're going to look at today. Matthew 12, 9. Let's pick it up in Matthew 12, 9. That's where we've been at is Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, 9. Let me read it here, folks. Departing from there, Jesus, he went into the synagogue Verse 10, and a man was there whose hand was withered. I told you it was like paralyzed would be the right way to look at it. And they questioned Jesus asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath the arrogance of the Pharisees so that they might accuse him? We covered this pretty well last lesson. Verse 11, and he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? Verse 12, how much more valuable than is a man than a sheep? And notice the exclamation point, Matthew 12, 12. Very serious statement in the original language. So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, matter of fact, stop the nonsense is a good way to look at it in street terms. Matthew 12, 13, and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand, the man with the paralyzed hand. He commands him to do something, because look at that. It's obviously a command, the exclamation point, the way it's written. He stretched it out. And it was restored to normal like the other, Matthew 12, 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. Look what happens when legalism doesn't like what it sees. Conspires against him as to how they might destroy him. And this, these type of events here, where it started very early in his ministry, within that first six or eight months of his ministry, when they started thinking, we got to get a, find a way to get rid of this guy here. Instead of saying, maybe this is the one, let's go check our Old Testament scriptures and our prophets. Matthew 12, 15, but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him, and he healed them all. And notice he withdrew when the timing was right. And I said last lesson, sometimes you got to know when to stand and know when to circle back around. Take spiritual discernment, Matthew 12, 16. And he warned them not to tell who he was. 
This was to fulfill in verse 17 what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Now, we'll get into that in a later lesson, these next couple of scriptures. Looking at verse 13 on the board, I want you to focus on that. Once the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had taught a principle on the Sabbath in grace, he then does something out in the open while the crowd inside the synagogue is already at the peak of interest. He's already gathered a crowd there. And actually, tension, there's tension building. Like I said, he wasn't afraid of these kind of situations. He kind of built up the tension the way he dealt with it, would show a lesson and kind of get the heck out of Dodge. I find that very interesting how he dealt with situations. Not the way Jesus is often portrayed in movies and literature, unfortunately. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't do this in such a public manner to show off. That's not what it's about. Look at me. Look, at I, look who I am. That kind of thing. It wasn't done in an arrogant way. He didn't operate out of arrogance or pride because he was perfect, even in his humanity. This, quite simply put, is another way to show that he is the unique one of the universe, kind of just giving a stamp that, yes, I am God, and I'm here to save you. You know what I mean? Follow me. It was done in, in with, it was, it was humility done on it. There was no pride or arrogance is what I'm letting you know. So quite simply put, he's letting them know he is the unique one of the universe, the divine God man sent to save the lost and dying world. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't do healings and miracles for the sake of arrogant pride showing off, nor did he ever intend to heal the whole world or give social justice to those who were oppressed. Let me say that again. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ didn't do healings and miracles for the sake of pride and arrogance to show off. Nor did he ever intend to heal the whole world at that point in time or give social justice to those who were oppressed. If that were the case, Jesus Christ would have failed. Look at the history. Because why? Why am I saying he would have failed? Think about it. The Roman military, the Jewish leadership continued to abuse and oppress the Jews, and not everyone in the world was healed when the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ walked the earth. Not all disease was removed, not everybody was healed. So he would have failed. Perfection, uh, royal family, perfection doesn't come into full fruition until what? The second advent of Christ. Which I'll actually be talking about that a little bit in my Malachi message. It's been a, uh, there's a lot of prophecy, in the, obviously, in those minor prophets as well. Uh, Christ did these type of things for the same reason he empowered his disciples to do them as a wake-up call as a wake-up call that God is here walking among you the kingdom has arrived pay attention this is important I want you to be saved I love you I'm here for you I am the Messiah notice the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ restores the man's hand look at verse 13 on the board Akapothis to my <laughs> Akapothis to may or my however it's pronounced to restore something to restore something bring something back to full health that's one of the ways it was described in that, that large Greek verb you're seeing. In fact, the two root words that make up that big Greek verb means to pull away, to pull away or remove something, then to replace that thing in a position of authority or to give it a new standing. Let me say that again so you understand it because, in fact, the two root words, if you broke it apart, APO, the apo there, and, and the, the rest of it, kastamamai, how this big long word. Um, if you broke it up into two root words that make up that big Greek verb, it means to pull away, the first part of it, pull away or remove something, and then to what? Place it in a position of authority. Place it in a position of authority or give it a new standing. Take it from here, put it over there, and it's fresh and new. It's, it's, it's put in a different position. Think about that. It's put in a different position. Only God, only God can restore mankind back to any kind of original perfection, we would say, which we saw in the garden, which we think about fellowship being restored. When we wash ourselves clean, we must accept the grace gift, though. So what is happening in Matthew 12, 13? He stretched it out. He stretched his hand out. He's accepting that grace gift, and it was restored. This is free will in action. Those that don't claim that we, you know, free will has nothing to do with the plan of God really don't know their scriptures. This is free will in action. He accepts the grace gift given to him. God has a visual of the finished product, folks. Mankind perfected with his son's perfect righteousness shining through us. Yes, he sees the end result. This is the restoration I'm speaking of. He sees us in perfection. He knows we're, we're there already in position. It's a brand new creature for us, we could say. Brand new creature. Perfection. But God was aware of it in eternity past because that's the way he planned it. He ordained it to be and therefore it should be. 
what we then receive when we are born again and saved is the grace gift of salvation. And with it, the grace gift of salvation, comes dozens of grace gifts. There's about 40 or more grace gifts given at salvation. It will probably be a lesson for another day as it takes several lessons, could take a couple hours to cover the grace gifts of God. But the Holy Spirit is leading me to highlight the interaction between the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the paralyzed man today. And that's the direction we're going in. It is very subtle, but the Lord Jesus Christ commands the man to what? Stretch out his hand. A lot of people might look over that. He commands him, and if the man didn't follow through, what would happen? Probably not a restoration. Jesus did not just heal without the permission from the paralyzed man. This was often the case, folks. If you read your scriptures, often this was the case. Not always, but many times. Not always, but many times. We see the person who needs healing has to come to the Lord, or at least be willing in faith to accept that healing. So there's something that's being done on the part of that either believer or unbeliever, depending on what standing they were in. And many times it was unbelievers, and they were beginning, uh, their faith was getting them born again and saved and healed at the same time. Each and every documentation of Jesus healing or performing a miracle was deeply rooted, deeply rooted in doctrinal principles that were meant to be teaching tools for the thousands of years to come, what I'm teaching today was meant to be taught on. There's probably 10 different principles in that one little sentence, he stretched out his hand. That's how important and how deep and wide and like a diamond, I always say, the scriptures really are. I'm going to have you guys turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 with me. <clears throat> Genesis 3. Ladies and gentlemen, I say it all the time and you need to hear it again. Free will counts. Your free will matters. Your choices, the things you make, your positive volition, however you want to look at it, decisions, counts. You can never fill your hand if it is tight, fist, closed, as I said at the beginning. You can never fill this if it's closed, right? You have to open it up. Hebrews 11:6. without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God, he who comes to God. Think about that, coming forward to God, must believe that he is and that God, he, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It should really be. Um, because anytime it says seek, a lot, well, a lot of times in the New Testament, it's really talking about a very strenuous effort. So there you go again. Free will, making a strenuous effort, means you have something going on. There's an effort there going forward. He comes to God. He who comes to God, there it is, is a rewarder of those who are seek. Seek means you have to do something. In the original language, like I said, oftentimes it means a strenuous effort. Coming to God takes humility. Washing oneself clean, we spoke about this. Opening up the floodgates of fellowship. Those are all things you make a positive decision to do. Look what happened immediately after the fall of mankind. Once guilt and shame entered the soul. Think about that, because that's what happened. The birth of sin was a choice to be independent from God. A lot of people ask, what was the first sin? Was it lying? Was it this? Was it that? It really started with Satan, we think about it, and then the replication of it. The counterfeit put on mankind, as we would say, right, um, of, of, of really replicating or imitating Satan on a different level. Independence from God, similar to Satan's original sin. It wasn't a sin of violence. It wasn't perversion. It wasn't drunkenness. It wasn't any of those things that we like to scream and holler, look at that sin on the overt. It really wasn't. It wasn't overt. It was interior. It was thumbing their nose at God in the interior of their mind, seeking independence from the will of God. The action is a bold statement that Satan made. I will be my own little God. That's really what it says. I will be. When you make those choices away from God, you're independent. You're saying, I'll be my own little God. That is what Satan did. Look at Genesis 3, 6. Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, with her, and he ate. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew they were naked, and they so now comes the shame and guilt as well. There's a whole bunch of uh, doctrine wrapped up in these first two or three scriptures here in, in Genesis right here, uh, between 2, 3, and 4. It's, it's phenomenal the amount that's in there. We don't have time today, but sometimes you tear into these things, and the Spirit leads you there. But their eyes were open, they knew what they were naked, and they sowed, they sowed, they sowed. 
They did it themselves now. Fig leaves together. I'll fix my own problem. I'll take care of my own sin nature. Right? Fig leaves together made themselves what? Loin coverings. Genesis 3 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God, Jesus Christ, physically walking in the garden. Yes, physically. Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ who went to the cross, was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, giving Bible classes one on one to Adam and Eve. Yes, that's a fact, folks. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, it's foolish to hide yourself from God because he knows everything, right? So a lot of people always ask, why did they hide themselves? And why did God say what he said in verse 9? Genesis 3, 9, on the boy. Then the Lord God called to the man. Why is God calling? He knows everything. And said to him, where are you? Why do you think? There's about 10 different reasons, again, a doctrine that you could tear into and spend 45 minutes or an hour just looking at that scripture. This was shown, one of the reasons, shown to be an opportunity for fallen man and woman to present themselves to God. Free will choice. He knows everything, including where they were. So it was no shock. It was no surprise. But there's an opportunity to come forward. Come to me. I know where you're at. You're hiding from me. I'm not hiding from you. We hide from God. He doesn't hide from us. Genesis 3.10. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Fear, shame, guilt. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. I took care of this myself. I hide from God. Our negative behaviors, our negative choices, decisions, put distance between us and God. Hide us from God, even though he knows where we're at. When we make choices against the plan of God, neglect our relationship with God, it is a sign that we are striving to be little gods on our own. We know better than our own creator. That's what it shows. We know better than you, God. We're going to strive in our own area to do this thing, kind of be our own little gods. Look at the five I wills of Satan. If you've never seen them before, we're going to cover them quickly today. Great and interesting principles in the five I wills of Satan. Isaiah 14, 12, we see them highlighted. How you have fallen from the heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth. You have been weakened. You have, you who have, excuse me, weakened the nations. These were divine titles. Divine titles Satan held as the most superior of all angels. And Satan, excuse me, uh, Satan had possessed the king of Babylon and that is who's being addressed here, Satan himself, not the human king, because there's a possession going on here. Isaiah 14, 13, but you said in your heart, your thinking, your mind, your soul structure, I will, there's the first one, ascend to the heavens. Number two, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, meaning the stars of God reflecting the angels in reference to angelic beings. I'm going to raise myself above all of those angelic beings. Number three, and I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north, a place of great honor, high honor, overlooking all the militaries of the angelic militaries in a position of power and authority in the recesses of the north, which is four in verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will do these things. Number five, I will of all. Here it goes. It builds to a crescendo. I will make myself like the Most High, like a God, like God. I am going to become a God. I will ascend, meaning I will cause myself to rise above all others. I'll take care of this. I, I'm, 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 I'm good enough, I'm strong enough, and I know what to do. It's all about me. Look what I can do, and I can raise myself in positions of authority. I will cause myself to rise above others. I will do this on my own. I will use my own power. That's what it's saying, all these things. I will make myself powerful. I want you to think about the world we live in today. I will achieve great heights of authority or wealth. Think about it. The cosmic system. Cosmic system is full of what? Self-help programs, positive faith movements, positive movements, all kinds of motivational speakers that are actually incentive programs to what? Become great through human power, human effort, which places no emphasis on a relationship or alliance upon God. Do any of those self-help programs, unless they're Christian, obviously, have you focus on going to God and getting your source of power and inspiration and guidance and integrity and everything from God, from the Creator? They don't. It's about self. It's really like what the, to happened with the Tower of Babel. The cosmic system is full of self-help programs, positive movements. Actually, they're incentive programs to become great through human power and effort which places no emphasis at all 
on a relationship or reliance upon the one true God. And what, what are we supposed to do, actually? Philippians 4.13. What's the Christian's attitude? Paul's attitude and the Christian should have. I can do all things through who? Him. Christ, who strengthens me. I believe that's the scripture that Evander Holyfield, one of my favorite heavyweights, used to wear on his uh, boxing robe going to the ring. And he's one of the guys that beat Mike Tyson twice. And the reason Mike Tyson bit him on the air, because Mike was frustrated because he couldn't beat him, and Holyfield had no fear. He was fearless. Because he, he is a Christian. Now, I don't exactly like who he follows and some of the things he got into over his lifetime, but he is a Christian. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And Iron Mike... Iron Mike didn't like that. What happened to him? He, he thought he was the baddest man on the faith of the planet. And guess what happened? Hollyfield beat him twice. I believe through the power of the Lord. Because actually, Amanda Hollyfield stood in the ring. If you look at it, I think it's the second fight. Maybe it's the first one. He stood in the ring and said, now you have to bow to my God. Because at that time, uh, Iron Mike Tyson had got into Allah and all this stuff where he was praying in the corner with his palms up before every fight. And Hollyfield said, you need to bow to my God, meaning Christ. So I always love that about him. Anyway, little side note, sports note for you. Turn to Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. But this Philippians 4.13 is what our, our attitude should be. I can do all things through him, through Christ. That's where my strength and power comes from. You guys are going to go to Job chapter 42. This section in Job is when God had just given Job some insight on how powerful he is, God is. Uh, and if you looked at chapter 41, you were going to 42, but 41 covers that. In fact, chapter 40 and 41, God is allowing Job a glimpse at how powerful he is and telling Job, gird up your loins and stand up like a man. Do not question who I am or believe the nonsense of what people say or a situation may look like on the surface. That's basically what he's saying, because Job had his wife and friends putting doubt into his mind concerning the trials and suffering he was enduring. Job, yes, wife and friends were doing what? They were help putting doubt in his mind, which a lot of people do, and even Christians do it to each other, concerning the trials and sufferings he was enduring. We simply don't know what somebody's going through. Be careful how you start to open your mouth to somebody else and say, well, God's kind of punishing you because last year you were out of fellowship and you stayed away from the church for six months. That's none of your business. And you don't know, maybe God's blessing him out, and he's getting tested by Satan, which is what happened to Job. So you simply don't know. So get your nose, quit being a spiritual police officer, and you know, a fruit inspector, and get your nose out of people's business. Job 42, 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, what? And Job 42, 2. I know that you can do all, all things. There it is right there. Same scripture Paul was talking about. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Nobody can stand in your way. If God wants something done, he's going to do it. Job is now saying, whoa. <laughs> wait a minute, the God of the universe just reprimanded me if you follow verses uh, chapters 40 and 41. And now I'm getting the truth as to what's going on here. First and foremost, don't get arrogant and question God. Don't get arrogant and question God, especially when God is still in the process of working out his plan for your life. And isn't that just the case? Sometimes we start to question and we find out six months later if we kept our mouth shut and went through the next six months worth of trials or questions and just kind of kept pressing forward, God would have gave us an answer, but we were too quick to start spouting off. Why God? Why this? Why that? Think about God's timing and our timing. Two different things. Job 42.3. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared, is Job, therefore I have declared that which I do not understand, good place to be. I don't understand what's going on. And you know what? Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't, I don't know. And maybe I shouldn't know right now. Sometimes we need to get that attitude. Sometimes this is the best attitude. Sometimes this is the best attitude. Letting the humility of our own humanity come forth and living in your trust and faith in God. Let me say that again. Sometimes this here, right here, therefore I, I, I have declared that which I do not understand. I'm not going to try to keep figuring this out and lay, put, try to put a label on it to make me feel comfortable. I'm going to let God do what he's going to do and ride us through and trust in him. Sometimes this is the best attitude. Most of the time it is letting humility of your own humanity come forth and living in your trust and faith in God. Job 42, 4. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you, Job says, and you will instruct me. Great way to be. You will instruct me. Verse 5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And Job had heard the voice of the God through a whirlwind storm. Um, not that God had stood in front of Job so we could see him. We know that doesn't happen. God uses nature. 
A lot of times, especially in the Old Testament, you see God uses nature oftentimes to speak to his men in the Old Testament. Dreams was another way. Dreams and nature were very common themes of God speaking to his chosen people. That's what this is about. And Job has had his spiritual eyes opened up. His eyes are like, it's like, whoa, like I said, you can get a sense from these verses. He's saying, okay, I got from chapter 40, uh, 40 and 41, I hear you loud and clear, Lord. My spiritual eyes are opened up. Whatever knowledge that Job lacked of God before, he now realizes truly how God works in someone's life. And he's starting to shut his mouth and get humility again. Job 42, 6, therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ash cloths, now, now ashes. Remember, there was a way that in the Old Testament to show sorrow or mourn. They, they, they would um, put a sackcloth on and throw ashes or dust on them. It was a whole ritualistic thing. But what I want you to look at here are these two words, ma'ask and neham. Ma'ask, reject or cast off, move. It says retract. That ma'ask means to reject or cast something off, throw it off you or move away from it. And naham is the word there to find comfort from regret or consultation from something or someone. Take a note on those because this is interesting when you tear it apart and really look at it. Job is saying, in essence, that I reject or move away from my own thinking. I'm going to toss off or push away or move away from my own thinking. I'm going to reject my own thinking now. I'm now accepting God's counsel, God's comfort, God's way. That's what this is saying. I'll reject and push away that human viewpoint, my own viewpoint, and I'll accept the counsel and comfort that comes from God. Job is what? Stretching out his hand. Closed fist, frustration, open hand. Job is stretching out his hand to God. Now we're just before this was a clenched fist because his aggravation and he was listening to the voice of his wife and his friends, and he was starting to realize months and months have been going by, and I got I lost my kids, I lost my property, I lost my business. Now I have these boils on my skin. But if you look from verse 10 through 17, last chapter in Job you're in, Job 42. From verse 10 through 17, God does what? Completely blesses Job. Everything he's lost is doubled and blessed for years and years to come. Job lives 140 years happy, healthy, with wealth, double blessing and I often say that God will come through in his way what did I say at the beginning his way his timing and sometimes it seems to us like it's the last second of the last minute of the last hour of the last day it seems that way to us and oftentimes I joke about it when a financial gift will come in <clears throat> because I'll be and I tell people all the time from this channel it's not me trying to like tug at your heartstrings I'm just letting you know I'm completely self-employed I have two or three streams of income and this is a, just a tiny little this is it I would like it to be the big mainstream but um, I have to do my own taxes I have to claim all my own stuff pay my own medical monthly um, I don't have any of that stuff I'm completely self-employed so having said that sometimes that check comes in and it's the last second last minute last hour of the last day and you're like oh my gosh I can cover everything now and that's how it works sometimes and that helps to build my faith so I know God does it to me for a reason so uh, but it happens to me. I can understand that. I'm going to put this on the board. It's from Dr. Charles, uh, Charles C. Ryrie. Uh, he's a great man to get commentary and study under. I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. Um, the Ryrie Study Bible is phenomenal. I love that. It's one of my favorite Bibles. If we know God, we do not need to know why he allows us to experience what we do. Think about this now. He is not only in control of the universe and all its facets, but also of our, he, also of our loves and, and he loves us. Though his, what, ways, we don't always get them, are sometimes beyond our comprehension. We should not criticize him for his dealings with us or others, and we get involved in others' lives. God is always in control of all things, even when he appears not to be. Dr. Charles C. Ryrie. I'll leave it up there. Take a note on it, and I'll read it to you again. Let me clear my voice here. <clears throat> If we know God, we do not need to know why he allows us to experience what we do. Right? And we struggle with that. I need to know why this is going on. Sometimes you don't. He is not only in control of the universe and all its facets, but also of our loves. And he loves us. Of our loves, all the loves in our life, the way we love people, how they love us. We can't control that. Right? And he loves us. Though his ways are sometimes beyond our comprehension, most times they almost always are, we should not criticize him for dealing with us or others. 
Keep your mouth shut and go through it. God is always in control of all things, even when he appears not to be. Do you trust in God enough to seek him out? Ask yourself that. Because that's what it takes sometimes. Stretch out your hand. Open your heart toward him. There is a decision we make to accept the plan of God for our lives. And sometimes we have to do it daily and remind ourselves daily. And I know we take it back every other week because we think we have to get involved and, and that worrying about it and us putting our hands in it. We're going to solve it. But guess what? It doesn't. Makes it worse. We like to grab the steering wheel away from God while he's driving and say, no, 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 God, I'll drive for a while. How many times have we done that until we, what, crash the car? Or we get a speeding ticket, and then we got to slide back over to the passenger seat and allow God to go back into the driver's seat. We all do this. Amen to that. I know I do from time to time. You know, Joshua was a tough guy. I looked at him, and we're going to close with this, I think. Tough guy. He probably had some military or physical training while he was a teenager in Egypt. Um, there's, a, there's Some historians point to the fact that he might have been one of those that were training or being used as a training tool for the the Egyptian military, um, as a teenager, let's start young, let's say, you know, we baby our boys nowadays, they, back in the ancient world, at, at 14, 15 years old, they were getting treated like young men, he still needed to lean on God before battle, after everything he'd been through, Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, God says, Jesus Christ, be strong and courageous, he said this to him several times, if you know the scripture, do not tremble and be dismayed, which means he was, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And you're already a warrior, and yet he's dismayed or trembling. Wherever you go, God reassured Joshua, just like your mentor Moses, Joshua, just like the guy who mentored you, you were his right-hand man, I'll be there for you too. I'll take care of you too. God does not change royal family. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the same a year ago, a thousand years ago, a million years ago, and he'll be the same uh, a thousand years from now. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear. It doesn't help anyway, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about. That will age you. There's been medical proof on that one, folks. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. Not some kind of retreat you go away on. Not counselor. Not Dr. Phil and Oprah. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But we need to make some choices. We're responsible. We need to, to take responsibility to accept the plan of God. And sometimes we have to do it every day, as I said, and realize I'm going to let the plan of God play out here today. And I'm just going to do my best to stay in his plan. Name and cite our sins. Do our best to get back in fellowship. Free will matters. I say it all the time. It does. Draw near to him. James 4, 8. What does that say? You need to do something. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Wash this garbage sin from your life you sin is purify your heart you double-minded we're talking about how you think draw near open up your heart put out that hand clenched fish can't get it put out that hand draw near wash yourself clean from the old sin nature the cosmic system get your thinking right purify your hearts bible doctrine cleans it out circulating in your soul structure God has a plan for your life. Do you believe it? He does. In fact, he has angels set in place watching over you and I. Elect angels. As many as there are fallen angels, don't worry about it. we got elect angels too. So the attacks of the fallen angels, yeah, they're real. There are some elect angels out there too that do little things for us as well. They render service to us. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who what? Inherit salvation. You're a believer. You inherit salvation. That paralyzed man in the temple we noted in Matthew chapter 12 could have withdrawn his hand because he lacked the faith and he would have remained in the same broken state he was in. Many of us do. He stretched out his hand. He stretched out his hand because he heard and obeyed the command of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Nothing happens until we reach out, folks. If you're waiting for that new job to drop in your lap, guess what? You might have to do some legwork. Okay, nothing happens until we reach out, until we make a serious decision and commitment to do our best to get inside the plan of God and develop a love relationship. Very little will happen, spiritually speaking, for the believer. Let me say that again. Until we make a serious decision, and you stand in it, and commitment 
to do our best to get inside the plan and develop a love relationship, get momentum in there with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with God, very little will happen, spiritually speaking, for the believer. Very little. Job probably went through about 10 months of physical attacks, mental attacks, financial attacks, and he came out the other side doubly blessed. Doubly blessed. The 10 months or a year, whatever some scholars claim it to be, must have seemed like a lifetime. Must have. Seemed like a, yet it passed. Must have seemed like a lifetime in the middle of it. It always does. Yet it passed and God came through. God came through as he always does. But it must, you know, when you're going through something, as I always say, you know, if you end up, if, if somebody you know that's a believer ends up dying of cancer in the last year and a half of their life, they were in the hospital and they were struggling and it was a tough year and a half, what is that compared to eternity? What is that year and a half? A momentary light affliction is called in the New Testament. Sorry to tell you, I know it's, 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 it's easy to sit here and say, but when we go through it, it's just our human nature. When you're six months into an illness, you're like, that's a lifetime. And I understand that. I understand where you're coming from. But I'm saying we have to learn to tap into our spirituality and get with the, inside the plan of God and walk in the new nature and trust that God has everything figured out. We can't see the, the, uh, the other side of the forest through the trees. God is the one who designed the trees. He knows what's on the other side of the forest. He knows where the promised land is at. We can't see it. And sometimes it's just 100 yards through the brush. But we can't see it. And some people give up 100 yards before the finish line. That's all I got to say to you today, folks. I will see you at, uh, I will see you next week, but I will also be on the Malachi message coming up this week, so keep an eye for that. It'll be on my front page. Any questions or emails, if you need, if you've sent a donation in uh, this past year and you haven't got a receipt from me, all you got to do is send me an email with an address and a name. I'll send you a receipt, and you can hand it off to your tax guy. Maybe it'll help a little bit. Who knows? But uh, I love you all. I appreciate it. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father. We thank you for this time. We're asking you to, to, to bless those that bless this ministry through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>